Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second session of Localizing Agenda 2030 webinar series. Uh, perhaps you already joined us last week uh, for our first session when we discussed climate adaptation and mitigation, or perhaps this is your first session in this webinar series. Nonetheless, warmly welcome. Uh, this webinar series is hosted by Nord Regio and the Nordic Council of Ministers. My name is Bipsa Salolami, and I am your moderator today, uh, together with my colleague, uh, research fellow Linda Randall. Uh, she's been studying the Nordic perspective on digitalization for quite some time now. Um, welcome, Linda. Thanks, Bipsa. It's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, Nordregio has been working now with this topic for, for quite some years and um, with a couple of the projects I think that are quite interesting for, for today's session is, is one around sort of governing the, the digital transition in Nordic regions um, where we went and spoke to, to um, municipal and regional actors about how they actually, how do they tackle this concept. Um, but we've also been doing some work around digital innovation in, in rural areas and, and how we can, we can support um, local innovation in, in outside of the bigger cities. I'm really looking forward to, to the day. Yes, me too. Uh, I think we have a very exciting program today. Uh, we have three uh, speakers uh, and also Linda. Uh, but uh, first Linda starts and then we have uh, Therese Bengard uh, from a national association called Hela Sveres Kaleva. And she will uh, tell a bit more how, how digitalization is affecting um, the rural of Sweden. And then we have Andreas Lundqvist uh, from Center for Rural Medicine in Västerbotten uh, region, which is um, quite north of Sweden, uh, and especially in Storuman municipality. And he will uh, explain a bit more uh, about these digital healthcare solutions um, that they have, and also how it's, uh, how it's been working with these different municipalities together in this region. And finally, we have Kasper Adam Mikkelsen uh, introducing us to Nabugu app, uh, which is about uh, mobilizing people, sharing car rides from less densely populated areas uh, towards perhaps um, cities. So I think we have an exciting day. Um, but before we get started with the program, I would like to introduce you to uh, this interactive tool called Menti. Um, now you should be able to see uh, the web address and a code on your screen. So we would like you to open up a new tab on your browser or perhaps on your phone and go to menti.com and then insert this code. And there we would like you to get started with our first um, Menti question. Um, we will be using this Menti tool uh, during this session just to get your views on things as well. So um, we hope that you will now have this um, menti.com um, open and you have successfully inserted the code. Uh, the code is also in the chat in case you, you missed it. Um, and the first menti question is kind of like a warm up. We would just like to get your views on how you think about digitalization. So just add Three or uh, two or three words, uh, the first things that come into your mind when you think about digitalization. Um, and we will look into the results um, in a short while. Uh, but before we do, um, I would also like to remind you that uh, we have this Q&A button also um, in the Zoom window. And there you can uh, ask questions for our speakers. And I will try to pick up those questions as we go along. And in case your question was not answered during this webinar, uh, you can join at 2.30 uh, Central European time um, to meet our speakers personally. So we will have these uh, additional uh, meeting rooms where you can discuss with each of our speakers uh, separately and ask follow-up questions. So take use of this opportunity if you have some more questions and would like to meet our speakers. Um, but before we go into the Menti results, uh, I, would like to, I would like you to also see um, one interesting statistic. Um, when you signed up for this webinar, we asked you um, how far advanced are you um, in your work when it comes to the SDGs? And here we have, um, I think, an interesting divide uh, between the stats. Um, 
I think it's it's nice for you to know who is in the audience that um, approximately 40% feel that they are well on their way when we work with the SDGs. But there is also um, many of you who are just getting started with this work and perhaps have tried to implement the work, but it hasn't really it hasn't really picked up yet. So um, I think I think this is also maybe a nice background information for our speakers today. And feel free to provide tips and tricks uh, for different uh, different people in different stages uh, when they work with the SDGs. Um, and actually, I, I wanted to contact one person from the audience. Um, welcome, Janna Puumalainen from the city of Joensuu. Uh, are you there? This city is in yes. the eastern part of Finland. Hi, Janna. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, could you just briefly uh, share with us, uh, you, you are part of the group who is just getting started with the work. And I would just really like to know, uh, perhaps, what are your expectations for this webinar series or for this specific webinar? And what kind of help would your municipality or city need um, to get this work going? And what are the biggest obstacles? Like, why is it so slow to get things started? Uh, thank you. Um, I think we. Well, first of all, uh, let you let, let me put you to the map. So Joensu is a city with 77,000 people, eastern part of Finland, next to the Russian border and center of the region and a university town. And we have quite an uh, ambitious climate target. We aim to be carbon neutral already by 2025. And I had the feeling that we actually work on many SDGs, but not under the SDG umbrella, but in very many different separate projects. And now we are looking how to maybe to have a coherent uh, framework and put all these uh, things what we are doing together and to really uh, see where we are actually going and then to see where are the biggest gaps and problems uh, what we should be doing. And of course, in this seminar series, it's very interesting to see where other cities and regions are going and what kind of good examples there are. So I, I'm especially interested for benchmarking and having useful uh, hints uh, of experiences, what to do better and how to, how to improve in our town. Mm. Thank you, Jan. I, I hope we can answer these uh, questions for you and hope you'll get some inspiration for your work um, this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then I think it's time to take a look at our Amenti results. Uh, I hope you have had the time to um, answer um, the word cloud. Um, or did it go by too fast? Uh, so we would like you to open up a new tab on your browser or perhaps on your phone and go to menti.com address and then enter this code that's 50, 13, 37, and one. And as soon as you've uh, inserted the code, um, you'll be able to answer this question. So just insert two or three words when you think about digitalization. I need to think too hard, just the first ones that come up for you. Exactly, just to get you started. <laughs> These are encouraging words so far. <laughs> now, um, I will let Linda uh, to reflect on these words uh, in a short while. And then Linda, perhaps um, you could also uh, introduce us to your work a little bit more. Yes, definitely. I'm, I'm, they're moving as I'm, I'm, just as I have a thought, they're moving again. But um, <laughs> I, I think for me, these are really kind of encouraging words in that, um, I think, um, and I don't know if encouraging is the right word because perhaps the first point of, of, of my presentation today is um, already completely self-evident for this audience. Um, but I think this, this large word here, kind of efficiency is a kind of an interesting one because 
think this can mean kind of many things and particularly in the context of um, of thinking about uh, using digital tools to to create a more equal society um, I don't know how compatible that is with having efficiency as the main goal of our digitalization work. So, so perhaps that's something we can maybe reflect on in a, in a little bit. Um, yeah. It's quite fun how this just unfolds in front of your eyes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's I, great to get people's view on, on things. Yeah, it's really. Uh, so, and I think also, you know, making things easier is nice. So we have, I saw fear in here, but it gets scary, but it became very small scary. So that's good. I think that's we're, good. We're, it's okay to be a little bit afraid, but it's good that that's not the big one. Um, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Okay. Nice. All right. I might actually, we, maybe we can come back to that one if people are still adding. And I think, you know, feel welcome to, to continue to share words. I think... In some ways, that was a warm-up question, but I think it's always a tough one when you don't have these boxes to tick and you have to think think of, of a word yourselves. I'm going to actually just share now my screen. Uh, and as Pitsa said, I'm going to tell you a bit about Nodrega's work with digitalization. Um, so um, I think perhaps, as I said, my, my first point here is a little bit self-evident from your responses. So. Um, when, when we first started working with digitalization, to be honest, I was a little bit terrified myself. That scary would have been quite big for me because I sort of landed in the, these, uh, with this kind of digitalization project. And personally, I'm not so tech savvy. And um, I was really happy to learn quite, quite quickly, actually, when we went out to, to the regions and municipalities and spoke with what you could consider, I guess, the digital front runners in, in this this kind of concept of governing the digital transition. When we started to talk to them about what this, this idea of digitalization, what does it actually mean? Um, most of them really told us that, that it's not really about technology. There's a small piece that's about technology. Um, and that piece is mostly about, you know, finding the right contractors to work with and sort of identifying what sorts of digital solutions might address the challenges that we face in our communities. But actually the bulk of their work um, was about this kind of human process and, and I guess this kind of um, a process of kind of change management you can say um, and I think there was one participant in this study that actually talked about this you know it's a little bit old now this metaphor so I, I apologize if you've seen it before but I'm yet to come across a better way of kind of conceptualizing this this kind of idea so so when he talked about his work he said um he said to me, imagine that you have a pop band um, and they have their own instruments and they're very happy. You can see they're playing in their pop band um, and, and you decide that you want to turn these guys into a symphony orchestra. Um, so you go out and you buy them some new instruments. Um, so we have the pop band, we have the musicians here, we have the instruments and then we have a symphony orchestra, right? Um, but I mean, of course, it's not so simple. So those that are playing the music, they might not want to change. Um, they might not actually have the skills that they need to play the new instruments well. They might have to learn new skills. We might even need to bring in new people to, to ensure that these instruments are going to be played well um, in the long term. Um, if we think about the audience, um, if they've been listening to pop, and some of them, maybe they've been listening to pop music their whole lives. <laughs> Um, they, they might not have even heard classical music before. It could be a big change for them. Um, so I think what, what this metaphor really nicely kind of encapsulates for me is that when we, we use this language of digital solutions, we can kind of trick ourselves into thinking that, that the tools themselves, so in, in this metaphor, the, the instruments, that they mark a, a finished product. Um, but actually, in, in many cases, the journey has kind of just begun at this point. Um, so I guess the first point that I want to make today is that in our work with digitalization, it's really important to, to start with the people and start with the communities and not to get too focused on, on the digital solutions. Um, and I think your responses in the word cloud kind of convinced me a little bit that uh, you, you kind of already know this, but I hope you enjoyed the, the fun metaphor anyway. Um, the second thing I want to talk about today is, is about who has access 
to the opportunities associated with digitalization because of course we're talking about um, equality here today. Um, so when I first started preparing for this presentation, I'd actually planned to frame this in the context of this, this concept of the digital divide. So you can see my nice cliff picture here is sort of getting a bit at that. But actually once I started putting it together, I, I decided it was perhaps more useful to frame the discussion around the concept of digital capital. Um, so, so digital capital is a concept from a, a British um, researcher and it basically has two pieces. The first piece is around digital access, so con connectivity, um, the tools and equipment to, to get online and digital competencies, so the, the ability to actually use those tools. Um, so um, at a basic level, accessing information, commu communicating with others, but then becoming more complex, get being safe online, um, and also maybe creating your own content or, or even your own digital tools. Um, so who has digital capital in a Nordic context? Um, here on the map, we can see, um, so if we start with the, the infrastructure side, so all the Nordic countries aim for um, 100 uh, super fast broadband, so 100 megabits per second for everybody or, or almost everybody at various points over the next five years. Um, and as we can see on the map, in many municipalities, there is a long way to go. Um, and overall, we know, so the, the very lightest shade there where that almost probably looks invisible there on the map, um, less than 35% of, of the people in those communities have access to these speeds now. Um, so, and, and overall, if we think about the sort of by municipality type, so thinking about urban or rural municipalities, um, we know that that urban areas are much more likely to have these faster speeds. Um, and this obviously has knock on effects if we transition over to that competence side of, of the digital divide. Um, we see in terms of use of technology, um, this, this graph is looking specifically around accessing healthcare information online. We see that, again, in, in, for the most part, um, we, we find higher levels of digital capital, so more likely to be seeking this information online in urban areas than in rural areas or towns and suburbs. Um, this one, it's the same indicator there, but, but here we're looking at age, here we're thinking about age. So, Again, probably not a big surprise, um, but I think it's nice to sort of remind ourselves here, younger people are much more likely to access information in this way. So we have the, the older people are the, the light kind of purpley dot at the bottom and the youngest people um, are the red and the, the yellow. Um, thinking about gender, if, if we look at something like, um, for example, just digital, general digital skills in day-to-day -day life, actually the Nordics perform pretty well. So there's not much of a gender gap here um, at all. In fact, in Finland, there's, there's no gender gap when it comes to having sort of a fairly good level of digital skill. Um, apologies to Iceland and Norway, it's the European Commission's data. Um, um, but if we, if we take um, maybe a, a slightly more higher level um, indicator here, and we look at, for example, who's actually creating our tech, who's actually building these tools, we see that the gender gap gets much, much wider. So, so the digital solutions that we're working with in our work are much more likely to have been created by a team um, with more men in it than, than more women. And I think this has, has implications that we can, we can talk about. Um, and of course, these categories cross each other. So we don't just have one of these identities. Um, if we think about, for example, an older woman in a rural area with limited financial resources, that person's gonna have be much less likely to have high levels of digital capital um, than, for example, um, a wealthy younger man in an urban area. Um, and I think this is where the, this notion of capital is kind of quite useful because in a way, like other forms of capital, the more you have, the easier it is to get more. Um, and I think so my second point here is that unless we're actually really intentional about the way we approach this work, um, there, there's great, digitalization can also kind of create and reinforce inequalities as well as potentially addressing them. So um, I think someone, I did notice inequalities was one of the words in the word cloud. And I think 
um, that that that's quite justified. Without action, we we see that that this this transformation actually does have the potential to result in, in great inequalities. Um, but of course, this is by no means inevitable, and I guess part of the reason why we're here today. So um, again, I, I think this notion of capital is quite useful because um, for me, it kind of shows that if we work in a targeted way with particular groups, um, th this work can have ongoing benefits that go well beyond our initial investment. So to take kind of a simple example, um, we could work with an older person to teach them how to Skype with their grandchildren in, in another country, maybe, or another town. Um, and, and this will result in them using a computer more. Um, and then when we go to try and teach them to use online banking, they, they have already a little bit of capital in the bank there. And, and we can see that kind of exponential growth. So that's just a small example. Um, but I want to just finish now with another example from one of our case studies that's at more of a kind of whole of community level. Um, so coming back to this map, um, as I said, mostly the lighter areas tend to be rural municipalities, but there are a lot of exceptions. There are several exceptions. Um, and one in particular that I want to just talk about is the municipality of Vardo up here in the furthest northeastern corner of Norway. So here, Almost everyone has access to super fast broadband on this very, very remote location. Why? Um, so we visited Wardo and, and to, to try and answer that question. Um, and actually it's quite an interesting story. So between 2000 and 2010, uh, Wardo commune experienced a population crisis. So they went from being 3,200 inhabitants to just 2,200 in the space of 10 years. Unemployment was 30%. Um, the school was ranked one of the 40 worst in the country. Um, and the national government had taken over the city's finances. Um, so as a response to this crisis, the municipal administration completely rethought its approach to public services um, with a strong focus on using technology as a way to improve residents' quality of life. So again, starting with the problem, they want to improve, improve quality of life and then coming after with the solution, the digital solution. Um, the first step was infrastructure investment. So that explains the map. Um, and that was followed by a range of more human-centered measures. And just to give one small example. So every pupil and teacher in, in Viagra School was provided with an iPad as part of a sort of complete reimagining of the school's approach to teaching and learning. Um, and the central part of this strategy was this idea that there's no reason why these students couldn't have access to world-class education, even though they live in a, in a remote location. Um, so to measure the results, again, we think about the people. We don't say the result is that everyone got an iPad and then we win. We look at what were the, the social outcomes. Um, in, in less than five years, Bardo School went from being one of the worst in the country to being above average nationally and regionally. Um, in, in 2016, all of the graduates made a successful transition to, to um, work or further study. Um, the populations remain stable and the financial situation is also stable with welfare benefits and social assistance whilst at their lowest point in 20 years. Um, and I think, you know, this what I can tell you a lot more about that case, but not right now. Um, but I think if we, if we look at this, it's a really nice example of how a coordinated effort to, to kind of increase the digital capital of the community as a whole um, can, can have a really big impact on increasing inequality um, but between municipalities there. Um, so to sum up, um, start with the people. Don't worry too much about the technology. We can hire people to help us with that. Um, but also recognise that if we don't, if we're not very careful with this work, um, digitalisation may actually result in greater inequalities rather than reducing them. Um, and, and finally, it, it is possible to kind of take things in that other direction. Um, uh, but I think we, we really need to start with, okay, looking at who, who has digital capital and really focus our energies with the people that perhaps have less. Um, and this is the example from Vardo. It's just, just one small example. I'm sure you out in the audience have, have many, many more. Um, and if you do, please join me after the seminar for our little breakout room where we can actually talk and see each other in a more um, personal way. Or, or, of course, you can always reach out and send me an email. 
Um, and I just uh, here's a couple of links to the reports that I've drawn on in the in the presentation, and also just wanted to point out that the the Information Technology Unit of the of the UN has some really great information about digitalization, about ICT specifically, actually, uh, and the goals that I think it's really worth checking out if you're interested in this area. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. That was that was really inspiring. It's amazing what these local communities can can do. Um, it's it's always very inspiring. Uh, and I think we will hear more about the the Swedish context from Therese Bengard in a short while. But before we do, I would actually also like to ask another Menti question from the audience. So I hope that you're still in this uh, menti.com address uh, with your browser or your phone and you still have the same code, so you're logged in to the Menti program. And we have a question. Um, what are the biggest challenges for your municipality when working with digitalization? Is it lack of connectivity, uh, lack of uh, digital skills in the organization, um, lack of uh, digital skills in the community, uh, lack of political support or funding, or is it difficulties uh, changing people's behaviors or ways of working? And we would just like to get a picture of the things that perhaps you're struggling with. And I realized we never gave you an other. So if you have another challenge, welcome to write it in the chat. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it seems like one is, <laughs> one is more significant than the others. What do you think, Linda? This is exactly what we find in all of our all of our research projects. Is, is um, I think um, yeah, the I think when we think about technology, we think about this super fast pace of change, um, and we think of this in a way. We get this. I get this image of like a racing car, and oh my gosh, we have to get on this car. But then when you actually <laughs> drill down and look at what it means to implement a digital solution, where prior to that the the way of working was analog. Um, whether it's within an organization, whether it's within a community, whether it's in a business, it's really tough and slow and it's more like the horse and cart pulling along, you know. So, so I, I think, um, I think, yeah, it's digital, cha uh, you know, t technological change it, it can be understood as being fairly rapid, but I think social change goes much more slowly. This is what exactly what we find as well. Um, Thank you, Linda. To see this lack of political support and funding, though, that's one that we don't tend to find. But I think that's because most of our examples are kind of more front runners. So they, they get that way because they have the political support. Mm. Yeah, perhaps. Thank you, Linda. Uh, I think it's time for our next uh, speaker, uh, Teresa Bengar from Hela Suarez Kaleva. Here. We are excited to hear about the uh, rural Sweden and its inspirational cases, and also perhaps struggles when it comes to digitalization. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Therias Bengad. Uh, I live in Hammarstrand in the municipality of Ragunda in the county of Jämtland in the middle of Sweden. And this is me uh, in my home place. And as you can see, I'm very happy living here. Uh, I am the uh, managing director of an organization called uh, Hela Sverige ska leva, All of Sweden shall live. Uh, and we work with the rural areas of Sweden. Uh, and if you shorten our name, it's all of Sweden. And uh, uh, that also in Swedish means that we will heal Sweden. Uh, so um, we work with good conditions throughout the entire country, rural development and the balance between countryside and cities. So I will talk uh, about this uh, some today. Uh, I will talk about what I feel is some of the trends and the bigger pictures, uh, and also try to uh, connect some with uh, what Linda uh, have said uh, this um, uh, earlier. 
but it was very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, maybe the picture of what uh, the countryside and the people living there uh, is this. I don't know, you don't think so, but uh, there are uh, usually, unfortunately, uh, a picture that we are unmodern, uh, somewhat behind or not so very smart, maybe. This is a picture from a Swedish TV series uh, who is running on TV right now. Uh, and I think that uh, pictures and perception of places can also affect how you look at them and, and how you think that they should be. Um, on the opposite, uh, you often hear people talking about smart cities and smart is also a word that we connect with digital uh, and digitalization. And it's very associating with being smart. And if you don't, don't think that uh, the people in the rural areas are that, it's, it's a problem. Uh, the paradox here is that uh, the problem that we see in the rural areas where uh, the services might have been uh, less and less uh, good, that we have distance between uh, us and, and other things, uh, you see that the uh, problem solving is uh, doing it digital uh, and uh, as Linda was speaking is maybe not always uh, there we that we are there today but I will also say that uh, I don't think that we always are behind in this uh, and it can be more maybe an age difference uh, that we have more people uh, that are older that live in the rural areas uh, than uh, that we are behind. Um, the rural and, and digital solutions, uh, I think there are very, very many opportunities uh, in uh, developing this because this uh, would mean and is like the pandemic have shown that you can work from everywhere uh, almost there are a lot of works that you can't do but very many work today can be done from uh, places all around the world uh, self-driving vehicles this is uh, a picture of a, a tractor uh, that uh, has um, I don't know if they have a remote control or whatever, uh, uh, but uh, it's uh, a thing that then can be um, more sufficient in the uh, future. E-health, we will have a very interesting um, uh, 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 lectures uh, afterwards in this. Uh, so you should hear about Sturman, it's very interesting. You can study everywhere, uh, where Linda's example is perfect for, for showing that. We have independent production, uh, like 3D scanners or whatever. And you can sort of print out a rabbit or what that might be uh, for use. Um, uh, and also, of course, this um, uh, that the lack of service now can be uh, much better in the rural areas where I can order anything I would say to my front porch uh, today. Uh, data center is of course also something, uh, especially in the uh, north of, of Scandinavia, it's perfect to have a data center that will be uh, very much um, uh, uh, a good thing if you have like uh, a climate that is cold and a lot of electricity that you produce. And of course, what will be with AA and uh, robots and so on? How will that change uh, how we work and, and what people can do and so on? Um, it's a new world. It's a new um, uh, world after. And I would say uh, starting uh, even uh, uh, before the pandemic, more and more people ask for another way of living and a lot of people dream about having that own house or, or garden. Uh, so uh, we can see in all of uh, the world, uh, I would say, uh, that uh, people are uh, fleeing the cities uh, and trying to find home outside uh, of the big cities. Um, 
James was very hard on saying that New York City is dead. I don't think that, but uh, it's uh, another um, way of life uh, that we can see right now. And uh, the man the, uh, is in pink shirt. He has uh, moved to the rural areas of Finland. I would say uh, I thought that the biggest problem uh, in Sweden was that uh, that we have like uh, um, created a um, uh, world that we think that we are finished by uh, the uh, building out the broadband, but that's not really true. And unfortunately, I can see on Linda's maps that we have a very long way in uh, all of our countries. Uh, we are not done uh, building this and, and this shows that in the rural areas we have 50% um, left to be built to have like this uh, 100 megabit uh, um, broadband. Uh, so uh, when you work in a municipality in a region it's very important that you focus that if everyone uh, will be taking part of the new digital world, it's very, very important that we also can do this. But as if you don't have electricity, it's very hard to put on uh, a lamp. Uh, and if you don't have broadband and, and good uh, connections, it's you can't be a part of this new world. Um, I would say that uh, 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 we have, uh, as I said, a lot of work left to be done. We have in Sweden what we call white spots or uh, maybe black holes, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and we have to cover this, that uh, the, the old maps of Lindus uh, will be dark blue. Um, when it comes to connections to housing that uh, you have built an area, but uh, one or two of the houses didn't uh, connect broadband, it's, it's a very, hard uh, thing to to do because it's very uh, expensive to have these houses that didn't say yes the first time. Uh, I think it should be on top of the agenda in the municipality, in the regions. Uh, how can we uh, provide this? How can we do this uh, work? Uh, and of course, also think how can we use the digitalization uh, to be better uh, communities. Uh, companies, Network Association, and of course, Brad Broadband Association is very, very important to be building out this broadband uh, all through uh, Sweden, but also through the whole world, I would say. So it's very important that we work together. Um, but I will also say, uh, to be uh, sort of uh, in contrast to myself, that everything cannot be digital. We have to, when we do this, think what things are good to be digital, but also what can we don't be uh, digitalizations, uh, because think some things are supposed to be happening in the real world. Uh, and uh, I'm afraid that at the rural areas will see that the only problem solving is to, to digitalization uh, everything. And that is not um, uh, very good to do that because some of the things should be experienced in real life. So we have to do this smart when we do this uh, and also have uh, an opportunity to still be seeing each other and doing fun things together. I think there are a lot of potentials uh, in this. Uh, there are a lot of potential in doing uh, this. It can create uh, an equality uh, in the whole uh, uh, world, I would say, if we connect uh, together. And uh, as Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict your future is to create it. So I hope that we can create a good uh, uh, world together. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa. And I do feel like I speak on behalf of everyone that we all miss these real life encounters. And I think we all agree that we definitely want to meet in real life soon as well, even though this has been um, also a good leap in the digitalization process. And it's also remarkable to see 
how quickly we can adapt when when there is an actual need. So I think it's been an an incredible learning process um, in in like in all the countries, like how how people have been very very capable when when the need is there. Um, but I, I also want to point out when we talked about these broadband connections and Linda's map, um, I think it's still worth noting that Sweden is still in the advanced countries when it comes to broadband connections. Um, and throughout the country, like it's pretty stable that, that you have created these processes that it's, it's actually ongoing um, if you compare it to the neighboring countries like Norway and, and, and Finland. Um, so something you have done right in Sweden to, to make it better um, in that sense, perhaps, perhaps um, your organization has even worked with this um, maybe more more actively. I don't know. Uh, perhaps you could you could also comment that or perhaps Linda has some some insights also from from the Nordics. Um, how come Sweden stands out in a more equal way in that sense? Maybe, Therese, it would be really interesting. I'm not sure if everyone knows about the local fibre networks in, in the Swedish context, which I know Helis Ferris-Galeva has a big role there. I think this is a really interesting kind of, uh, and potentially something that might have something to do with the dark spots on all the dark spots on the map mm. of Sweden. Yes, uh, we, we've been using the support from the uh, EU uh, to uh, support, uh, um, as I said, broadband associations uh, that locally builds and plans and, and uh, builds the, the fiber nets. Uh, so it's, it's very, maybe unique. Uh, we think it's like we have done that all the time. You know, we have like road uh, associations and we have like water and, and so on. Uh, and uh, this has been very, very successful. And uh, for, uh, I would say, very efficient economic uh, thing also. Um, uh, and, you know, the the engagement you do when you when you build for yourself, it's very good. You know, you think that uh, uh, I will do that because it's the future. And you also get a very high rate of, of people wanting to be a part of this, uh, that, that they want to connect your house because you're, all your neighbors are doing it and we're doing it together. So that's been a, a good uh, thing. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, maybe the last couple of years, uh, we have had less of this uh, um, uh, fiber um, new association uh, making it and the, the big companies has taken over more and unfortunately they maybe not, not have uh, um, had this, the same um, uh, success in building. Mm. Uh, yep. And at the local level you always need these active people to be yes. the drivers um, of, of these uh, projects and I guess it's the same issue in Sweden as I, I believe it is in the other Nordic countries that it's also sometimes a bit tricky to get companies involved in building these broadbands and the bill can actually be um, really big if, if there is no interference from the government. So um, I don't know if you have any experiences on that. Yes, on I would Sweden. say that, that you are correct in that description. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as, as you know, if, if you are doing something in your own local uh, community, you know the people, you know the, the roads, you know the, the how, how to plan and, and exit. But, but I will also say that, of course, when, when these people are building, they are not, you know, like, I don't know what to call it, but it, they don't do the technique. It's, of course, no. uh, other... Um, very good firms that does that but but the planning and so on it's very good to have the local community with you um yes yeah uh we have a question from the audience if you could uh, pinpoint some municipality in sweden who has perhaps done a really good job like do you have a good example to share mm. uh, i would say that that uh, uh, there are no it's not like in in the north of Sweden or in the south of Sweden. It's it's very different be, between these. There are some communities in the north of Sweden that, that have like ninety eight uh, percent, uh, and and also in the south of Sweden. Yeah, I could uh, 
uh, make a list for some some examples uh, i don't have everything in my head you know uh, so uh, and send that uh, so so i can uh, make some tips uh, what yeah. where, where you should uh, look mm. yeah Sure, uh, but I, I think we're, we're about to hear from one of the great examples uh, from this Center for Rural Medicine in Storuman municipality uh, in Westerbotten region. Um, Andreas Lundqvist, perhaps, are you there? Thank you, Therese. I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, we're excited to hear um, how your municipality and region are collaborating in this Center for Rural Medicine. So please. Perfect, thank you. I'll start by sharing my screen then. I hope you can see it. Yes. Perfect. Well, uh, my name is Andreas Lundqvist, as, and uh, I am the head of unit at the Center for Rural Medicine. Uh, Therese started with a picture of her uh, uh, home place, and this is a picture from where I live. This is a picture of the lake story and it's called the same place uh, same name as as the actual town let's see if i can skip ah here we are yeah and then a little bit about the center for rural medicine i'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do i'm going to talk to you um, give you some examples of uh, projects that you, we've been working on during the years that that uh, kind of exemplifies have we uh, how we have been working together with the municipalities on on uh, uh, improving uh, the way of life in in rural areas but starting with the the center the center for rural medicine uh, we're uh, a research a small research and development unit within region westerbotten we were founded in about 2014 and we've existed in, in other uh, forms uh, before then, but 2014 was the kind of uh, the birth uh, for us. The head office is located in Storyman. You see the map of Sweden to your right, and the, the, the rightmost uh, map depicts Westerbotten, and the, the light green area is Storyman. Uh, we have uh, about 15 employees spread across the entire northern region. Uh, I have one outlier when it comes to staff. He's located in Schippenham, but we like him too. Our funding mainly comes through various project funds, and we have about 4 million Swedish kroner in core funding. And we have uh, built up an extensive experience in collaborating with regions and municipalities, as well as universities and private companies over the years, both nationally and internationally, I should say. Uh, rural areas or, or sparsely populated areas is not as you all know, and it's not a Swedish concept. We, uh, we have uh, examples from all over the world and, and we all need to find uh, joint solutions here, here. We can learn a lot from each other. Uh, this is how we try and describe uh, what we work, all, all our work here at the Center for Rural Medicine. And we can start by looking at the center of this circle research in, in, and development in rural and remote areas. And, and we think that that's important to stress because if you, should, if you want to have some kind of credibility when it comes to rural health or rural issues, we think that you should be based in a rural area too. We have um, all over the world, we see a lot of examples of research institutes uh, working with rural areas, but from a more urban perspective. And we think that you you lose some of the, the you lose some of your credibility then. Uh, as you see, a large part of this circle uh, is the topmost part, and, and that's good quality local healthcare in rural and remote areas. And historically, and right now, a lot of our projects uh, going on uh, has been, it can be uh, put in, in this part of, of, of the circle. Uh, a lot of our work has focused on how to bring healthcare closer to uh, a rural population. In, in uh, the north of Sweden, we have long distances to almost everything. And especially if you're located in the inland part of, of uh, Sweden, which we are. So that's uh, a lot of projects have been focusing on, on how can we bridge distances using telemedicine, for instance. We also work with uh, Sami Health since that's our uh, indigenous people here in Sweden. And from an international perspective, the Sami are 
uh, th there's not been that much research on on their health situation so we are working quite a lot with that both in uh, in uh, in uh, development um, projects in, and also in, in research projects and and lastly last but not least we work a lot with education and recruitment since we have uh, seeing that they, those are key factors if we want to be able to provide a good quality health care in, in rural areas. We need to educate staff and we need to be able to hire them and make them stay. How, how can we retain staff? It's also very important. Skipping on to some of our uh, pre, uh, earlier projects, what we have implemented in the past, just a, a small uh, outline of those. As you can see, a lot of them ends with uh, at a distance, and that sort of uh, puts the finger on, on what we've been working on. A lot of projects, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning here, it has been focusing on how can we bridge distances. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, about one of these concepts, the virtual health rooms. So let's go over to, to that. This is a picture from Slussfors. And uh, as you might see, that's me trying to pretend, uh, pretending to, to uh, be a, an assistant nurse. And this project was a, it's a very good example of a collaboration project between the region and a municipality, and in this case, Storuman municipality. The village of Slussfors is a very small village in Storuman municipality, and it's located between our main uh, town centers in our municipality. So in Slussfors, they, they have long distances to everything. They have 60 kilometers single way to the nearest healthcare station. So together with the, with the municipality, we decided we want to do something for, for the population here, and we want to provide a better service for, for the population in, in this village. In this case, we, of course, wanted to focus on bringing healthcare closer to the patient and, and thereby also reducing the need for traveling. In the concept, we, in the room, I should say, we, we wanted to test models for the healthcare of tomorrow. We wanted to, to uh, make use of what we call our demographic advantage. We wanted to try out new equipment, new methods, and kind of see what can an aging population manage by themselves. So what you could do in this room is, is, of course, as you can see as an example of in the picture here, we could have remote consultations with the help, perhaps, of an assistant nurse from the municipality's home care, uh, where you could have then a specialist look, uh, sitting at the other end of the video equipment. But you could also uh, use equipment for self-monitoring. There's been equipment in Slows Force, for example, for checking your blood pressure, blood glucose, hemoglobin, and so on. And the results of those tests have been uh, could be sent digitally to to a database that could be monitored by a doctor or a nurse. So this is one of uh, of a uh, one good example of of where we've been working together with the municipality. Uh, on to another project. This is. Uh, an example of a project uh, on an, another, from another level, I should say, the healthcare and care through distance spanning solutions was a priority project forming part of the 2018 Swedish presidency of the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, which consisted of three blocks. One of those was uh, one of those was to map Nordic distance uh, spanning solutions in healthcare and care throughout the Nordics. And uh, the, the other block, uh, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, was to identify methods and tools for implementing distance solutions. Uh, the last uh, part was uh, helping regions and municipalities uh, supporting them. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk to, to about that that much. But the first part of the project resulted in this publication, where the 24 most interesting distance spanning solutions are presented. Uh, you'll get this presentation afterwards, and you'll have the link so you can download this uh, present this publication. It, I think it could be ordered printed from from uh, the links here also. Uh, and what's interesting about these solution is that they are not projects, but because what we see uh, and have seen when we went when we did this mapping exercise was that a lot of uh, really good uh, solutions they stay in the project phase or they stay in a kind of 
project implementation, pilot implementation phase. And these solutions, the map solutions, they are actual working implemented solutions. They are not projects. So please check them out. Another thing that we saw in the project is that uh, uh, a lot of all, all of the Nordic countries have very fine and, and uh, uh, high aiming strategies for, for e-health, uh, but we did not see that many uh, really practical solutions. How, how, how do you get started? How should you do it? How should you implement it? But we, what we did find is that in Norway, they have something they call Veikat for Tjeneste Innovation or Roadmap for Service Innovation that has identified six phases that you should you really should go through in order to implement uh, these solutions successfully. And uh, I'm really glad to hear what uh, Linda said in the beginning. You should start with the people because it's the same thing here. You should start by anchoring both with the population, but also with the staff that perhaps are going to use the, the solutions too. So you, that's a really key fact that you can't be skipped. Uh, and on to uh, I'm going to show all this. That roadmap that we found then in the in the that project we are now using in South Lapland, uh, the, the region where where I'm uh, the, the inland part of Region Westerbotten, where the region and the municipalities now are working together on implementing the Swedish national care reform, good quality local health care or good och nära vård in Swedish, and. There has been a lot of uh, reports and studies leading up to that reform. And one of the conclusions in the reports is that primary healthcare plays a key role in Swedish, in the, in the healthcare system. And the reports also point out that resources are limited and it's important to make healthcare interventions as effective as possible. And another, or perhaps the most important conclusion is that if we want to maintain uh, or increase the quality of healthcare that we, uh, with the current demographic changes and keeping costs under control, we need to do it differently. Health and social care cannot be organized as it is right now. As you might know, or as you probably know, Swedish healthcare is divided between the region and the municipalities. It's, and it's just that division that it's, it's been identified. It's, it's not a viable solution for the future. So what they're doing is that they are developing a, strategy, developing a strategy based on the Norwegian model. They are introducing at least two digital services in each of the municipalities in uh, South Lapland. Home monitoring devices is uh, being sent out to at least 100 patients and uh, finding 100 patients in South Lapland is a bit of a struggle, I should say, too, because we're not that, or of course, we're more than 100 people, but finding people that need that kind of, or can use that kind of home monitoring is a, quite a big task. So we, we need to, to address the whole of South Lapland. We can't use, use one of the municipalities, which also then stresses that we need to collaborate, collaborate and have a joint approach. And the last thing in this, uh, these projects are, is that we're going to analyze synergies and develop a joint structure for the region and the municipalities. And that's the last stop step in all of this work. And it's, we're hoping that we'll, we'll be done in two years. And uh, so the goal is March 2023, I should say. And with that, I am done. I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you here. I'm ending with a really nice picture of, of a season to come up here in, mm -hmm. in Storyman. You're very welcome to uh, take contact, make contact with us. We're fairly active of, on Facebook, so please check us out. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Andreas. This is really interesting. And I just have a quick follow-up question on well, like when you talk about anchoring um, uh, the roadmap and I'm just wondering like does the need usually come from the municipality side or are you more active like proposing like maybe you should actually think about this type of solution like where is the motivation and who usually has the need first and then I have a follow-up question is the, is the need usually based on on like the budget issue that we actually cannot afford to organize healthcare? Is it perhaps that there isn't enough 
uh, medical staff um, available, or is it just simply that we want to improve um, people's access to, to healthcare um, to make it easier? <laughs> all, all good questions. I think that uh, the, the I think both the region and the municipalities together have have understood that we we can't work like this. We we uh, we deal with it, the same patients, and the patient shouldn't have to to focus on who's providing healthcare right now. Do I turn that way or or this way? We want to have an integrated care, and that's something that both the the region wants and what the municipality wants. So that's I think we're quite equal uh, on that term. And uh, sorry, what was the other question? Yeah, I was, I was, yeah, it, it was about the, um, like, who does, who does the first move? Does it usually come from the municipality or the region? And then the follow-up follow question was like, what is usually the main motivation? Like, is it the lack of, lack of healthcare staff or perhaps it's a budget issue um, or just wanting to improve people's quality of life? I, th I think that the I think I would say that that both the region and the municipality both are active in this. Uh, perhaps the the first initiative ha has come perhaps from the regional point of view from from Region Västerbotten. Uh, Region Västerbotten is a huge organization compared to perhaps Storyman municipality or or social municipality, which is one of the smallest municipalities in Sweden. So of course. The region of Västerbotten has a lot more development staff, development budget to, to work with these issues. But on the other hand, the, the municipality, they have a quite big, quite extensive, uh, what do you call it, uh, responsibility when it comes to home care. And also parts of the primary care are part of the municipality's uh, burden, to say. And, and uh, so I think that the they are really interested in making this work. And, and uh, I would argue that the main, uh, perhaps motivation for this is it could be, if, if you're, the, the boring answer would be to say that it's, it's all about the budget, but I don't think so. I think that we've all identified that we need to work. It's not rational to have two organizations that they don't crash, but the, the, they don't work together seamlessly either and and the 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 borders between the organizations are a bit tough to overcome sometimes and especially in the smaller municipalities like Storium and like social like you could take any other of the municipalities here we have at the local cottage hospitals we have staff employed by the region and we have staff employed by by the municipality but they do the same work Kind of, but it's not always that easy to to uh, uh, to make that work. But we have in this. Actually, I would, would say that in the, in the smaller municipalities, we have a better uh, understanding of that. We really need to work together. Uh, we're handling the same patients, and the, the patient they don't care about who provides care. They just give it to me. Yeah, they just want the care. They want yeah. the care. They, they don't care about who, who actually <laughs> provides it. Yeah, that makes sense to me as well. Um, Linda, this was an interesting, uh, interesting example. Are you familiar with the Westerbotten work before? Yes, actually, no, Drago had a part in the um, healthcare and, and distance spanning technologies. And I wasn't involved in the project, but I followed it quite close, closely. And I actually often use this example of the best, I sometimes use your example of the healthcare room in, give a presentation. Um, I actually want to ask a question from a little bit different angle um, and I hope this is interesting for everyone else not just me but I think I thought it was a very good point that you made about the research and development about should be coming from the rural areas um, but what about the development of the technologies themselves like do you find that um, there are like do you have challenges in, in trying to provide care in this context that do they, I guess, do rural challenges need rural solutions from a technical perspective as well? Or do you, yeah, how do you, how do you come to the solutions themselves? Well, actually, we, of course, we don't have that many companies here that, that work with or provide these kind of solutions or, um, 
uh, work with uh, development in, in this, these areas. So, of course, we need to collaborate with university, with companies coming from the not so rural areas too. We need, we need that. But what we do see and what we've seen historically is that solutions that have been designed for a rural use or for, for a rural application, that solution, when that's ready, that can be transferred to a more urban setting. And that works perfect. It's, it's no, uh, it's, uh, the, the good example or the easy example would be the virtual health rooms or the community rooms that we're calling them right now. You could pick that up and put it in uh, Umeå or S Stockholm or, or whatever. But uh, the other way around is not that easy. If you develop something for an urban setting, that solution would not be easily deployable in perhaps Storuman or one of our smaller villages here in the municipality, because something that has been developed for an urban setting or something that you, you have lots of things, you have, a, you have a person doing this, you have a person doing that, you have resources for this. We, we can't take that for granted here. We don't have that. So if you design some, something that needs to have all that extra attached to it, it won't work here. So we really want to see more development going on in, in rural areas and then spreading it from here instead. Thank you, Andreas. I think it's time for our uh, final speaker. Uh, now we move on from uh, healthcare solutions to mobility. And uh, Kasper is actually here to introduce us to Nabugu app, which is about uh, sharing rides. Welcome, Kasper. Thank you so much. I see I have a little instability with my video, but um, I think <laughs> the sound is, is on. So you'll have it's that. It's on. Too. Yeah. So yes, thank you for the introduction. I'm the co-founder of uh, Nebogo, which is a local carpooling uh, concept, which um, I'm going to present a little bit uh, on. Uh, but first, I would like to just show you a very short video that gives a, a good introduction to the um, to the actual platform. So I'll do that by uh, sharing. And there we go. So it should be visible now. Yep. During rush hour, 19 out of 20 drive alone in their car. At the same time, public transport, which has the potential to solve the problems, is economically challenged by less use, especially in the countryside where the buses run less frequently. How do we stop this negative spiral? Peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing is part of the solution. We want to include private cars in the public transport system, and that's why we developed the NeighborGo platform, which creates matches between people going the same way. But it's more than that, because in the same platform, users can see all options with public transport. This way, they can find the best itinerary with only one search, for example, a lift with NeighborGo out in the morning and a bus home in the afternoon. To make ride sharing an easy choice, we created digital meeting points, which enables you to make a ride share appointment with just a few clicks. An example is the village Smiltopskeop, which originally had four daily departures by bus towards the nearby city of Vejle. After we launched Neighborgo, citizens of this village now has the opportunity to get a lift to several big cities in Denmark on a daily basis. The platform shows combinations of transport, so users can often find the fastest way to their end destination. For example, a neighbor go lift from the village to a station in the city, where they can jump on a train to their final destination. In Nebogo, we focus a lot on campaigns that we adapt to the specific location, because we believe campaigns become relevant and vibrant when we spread the word about ride sharing together with our local partners. People are embracing ride sharing and we look forward to continue to work with partners and to engage users in Denmark and in Europe. So I hope that gave you a little bit of an insight into the core uh, of what we do in NeighborGo. And I'll just give you a little more um, in-depth uh, presentation also. So I'll show you here uh, a short PowerPoint. So I'll share. like that. All right, 
So So what is NeighborGo? We, are, we, are, we have a mission to, uh, to create better mobility in, uh, in rural areas and by that also reduce urban congestion since people tend to travel from rural areas into cities. And the core of what we do, as you also saw in the video, is that we do that by supplementing and also strengthening public transport. So for us, carpooling is an integrated part of the mobility offering that you see in the rural district. Our company was founded in 2017 in Vejle, which is in Jutland in the western part of Denmark. And currently the, uh, the app and our, our small business is active in Denmark and Sweden, uh, but we are also on our way, on our way in other Nordic uh, countries and in uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. So just to, to let you know, um, uh, the business model uh, we have developed is also a little bit different that you usually see from, from uh, shared economy platforms. Since we actually have the municipalities uh, or regions and public transportation uh, authorities as our customers. So our concept is marketed um, as a mobility offering, just as buses and um, trains and flex taxis to the local citizens, companies and uh, educational institutions. And uh, we have had a very good and fast uh, market penetration uh, in Denmark, where we come from, but also now in, uh, in, in southern Sweden. So currently we work together with 25 municipalities in this space. And, uh, and in many cases, we also work uh, with their regions and uh, PTAs. Currently, we work together with four out of the five regions that are in Denmark and um, with the public transportation authorities that cover about two thirds of the, uh, the population. Um, and we have also formed a partnership with a, a private mobility actor, which is called Arriva, that runs regional trains in Jutland and Funen in Denmark. So why do they partner with us? Well, the SDGs, SDGs are actually quite fundamental um, to, uh, to why they collaborate with us. They do not necessarily all call it SDG. Uh, many have worked with the climate actions uh, and attractive communities uh, for decades, um, but the SDG certainly gives it some framework um, and it's mentioned more and more. So basically, the neighbor goal concept falls into these primary uh, SDG goals of sustainable cities and communities, where our take is actually a tool to fight mobility inequality and also create living rural communities. So the mobility inequality is a very big topic um, in, uh, in our countries um, since we see more and more investments going into public transportation, but it tends to only benefit uh, city dwellers who live, for instance, in central Copenhagen, central Aarhus, central uh, Stockholm, uh, rather than the people in the rural space. Um, so this is a tool to actually fight that inequality and also make it more attractive to live in the rural space instead of uh, moving to the, uh, to the cities. Uh, it's a very fundamental tool, uh, a basic tool within uh, climate change action. It's difficult to achieve any uh, climate change uh, action plan if you do not uh, work with the empty space in cars, especially in rural areas. Cars are by far the dominant uh, mobility form. And uh, the case today is that only there's only two people in every uh, 20th car. Uh, so there's an enormous uh, empty space in uh, in the cars, and if just um, if if just uh, every other car has two people, we are looking at at a 25% CO2 reduction just by by filling some more people in the same cars. And then this is really a, a very core uh, partnership uh, format that we have formed since we do reach out to both the municipalities, but also of course. Uh, local communities, companies, and educational institutions. 
So just to give you a little more insight in how we work, uh, I brought with me a little case from uh, Northern Jutland. Uh, some of you might be familiar with Skane, which is the northern tip of uh, the European continent. Um, and uh, so this is the region, north, northernmost region in, in Denmark. And here we work on a regional level together with the, the PTA um, and, the, and the region. And this is a very typical case uh, where we have uh, some municipalities which each, which each have their center town which public services like uh, uh, doctors and hospitals and, uh, and libraries and so forth, but also of course uh, education and uh, workplaces. And then you have the rural surrounding space, which today have very uh, poor connections. And the way we do carpooling, as you saw in the video, we set it up as a route-based carpooling where regular uh, commuters put in their, their trips into town and they can then pick up uh, other uh, villages on the way at these meeting points. And in this case here, the center towns also have train connections. So there's a train line traveling north-south into the much bigger city of Albo, which have about 200,000 uh, inhabitants. So by providing a bridge, by carpooling into these cities, we not only connect them with the city, we also connect them with the train station, which have half hourly runs into the, the big city. And of course, many also choose to, to carpool, share their rides all the way in towards the big city. But here, new problems arise if you want to, to drive your car into the center because of the congestion we normally see, especially across the fjord, which is a very, really uh, hard bottleneck. So here we have formed hubs uh, in the outskirts of the city where you can interchange into the city bus network and also shared bikes. Um, so you really get a very, very easy journey by not traveling uh, with your own car. And these hubs, meeting places and mobility hubs are very fundamental, both for our technical solution, but also in the actual journey, uh, journey that you, our users take. Um, the digital meeting places makes, makes it easier for us to work with a critical mass in the countryside, since we have these pickup points along the way. Uh, and it also makes the integration with public transportation possible and much easier um, since we can create a good travel planner option uh, by interchange on these hubs, uh, which I've shown one here, which is from Northern Jutland in one of the smaller towns where, uh, where we can change to, uh, to the bus. So this integration, as you can hear, is quite fundamental for us. Um, uh, for the users, it's not so much a carpool app, it's more of a mobility platform or a rural mobility as a service uh, platform, since we are integrating also payment, um, like public ticketing uh, in our platform also. Um, so currently we are shown in the Danish uh, national travel planner, which is used nationwide. And we also plan to be shown in, in two coming mass platforms in, uh, in Sweden, in, uh, in 2021. And what's very interesting is that you can see the combination trips or the combined mobility where you take a, um, a, a, a ride share to a station and then onwards with the, with the train. You, you have shown that in the public uh, travel planner and you can book your, um, your, your travel uh, right there. So we collaborate in Sweden with Traffic Lab which covers southern Sweden and in Denmark with the uh, with Reiseplan. And basically our app, the, the, the technical platform, is very much focused on showing people in villages the kind of new mobility uh, that they have. So this is a user here in a, in a village on Sealand, uh, which in the app can see he has two, uh, he has three different uh, directions he can travel in. And one of them actually connects uh, with a train station on the way. Uh, to open their mind on uh, where you can actually go uh, if you travel together with, with other locals. So, and fundamental is of course the people uh, who are actually acting uh, in, in this concept. Um, so 75% of what we do is actually mobilizing uh, people uh, at the local level um, to, to give this life. 
And here, the partnerships are our key to success. We always form uh, partnerships with, um, with the um, educational institutions, the local villages and the citizens and the companies. You can say very simply, there is a start and a end uh, for any everyday journey. And typically it's from home to, uh, to a workplace or a, a, a higher or a education place. So in a village, we actually form uh, sponsorships uh, together with the, the villagers. So they have a, a, a possible way of collecting money to, to the local sports club or other um, charities that they want to support by actually helping others. So this is a way of both creating new mobility uh, for the local level at, and at the same time collecting money to local level. Um, and so basically when we enter <laughs> into villages, uh, we typically get a very good start because it's a much needed service. Uh, there's a lot of frustration in villages that they are not, no longer connected with bus lines and they are so dependent on individual car ownerships. Um, and then in the center towns or in the cities, we form so-called mobility partnerships with educational institutions and companies. And um, they are quite eager to, to go into these partnerships. Uh, we come together with the municipality and the region. And at the same time, we actually solve real problems for them. Uh, in the rural space, it's typically uh, a problem uh, that their, their high school or their higher education is very difficult to, to access without a car. Um, so by implementing neighbor go carpooling, they, are, they have a much larger reach in the rural space and become more attractive to more people. Uh, and then the organizations also work with SDGs and uh, are searching for tools to act. Um, and this is very easy to act in for the companies and the organizations. Um, so therefore we typically form uh, tens and, and 20 of, of these types of partnerships in a local municipality. Thank you, Kasper. We're running out of time. Uh, do you yeah. still have some um, more? I am actually done. I just okay. have this last one here showing, um, showing how, we, um, how we market the service together with the Public Transportation Authority in Northern Jutland. Uh, so this is basically how we meet the users in the in the space. Uh, we travel together with bus, uh, train, and car. And um, then I'm finished. Thank you. Uh, we actually have a couple of uh, questions from the audience, and I was actually wondering those same things uh, myself. So. Uh, what is maybe a little bit still unclear uh, is that how does a person uh, pay for the ride? Is it included into the community, uh, like the communal train fare, or does does the app cost something, or does a person have to pay uh, every time that that they take a ride, and does the driver also get a, something back? Yes. Is that so, like Uber? <laughs> yes. So the basic concept is that. To, to take a ride with NeighborGo, you pay uh, on average one Swedish krona uh, per kilometer that you ride mm -hmm. with NeighborGo. And that money is transferred directly to the driver okay. via our platform. So we manage the transaction, but we take no fee on that. And yeah. the platform itself is free to use uh, for the end users. Uh, so it's a completely free tool that they can use, but they pay each other, of course, for the travels they make. In, in Northern Jutland and also in Sealand, the eastern part of Denmark, we will from February, the month of February, we will include neighbor go carpooling in uh, commuter passes. So if you hold a monthly pass to public transportation, you can upload that in, in the platform and use that as payment and then we pay, so to speak, never go with money from the Public Transportation Authority, pay the end user uh, mm -hmm. these fees. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, if somebody is really interested in this topic, uh, you should join Casper in a short while uh, to interview him more. I just have a quick question because I was thinking about Teresa and how this would fit in the rural 
context of Sweden. And she actually already asked in the chat discussion um, that how have you considered these taxation issues that apparently in Sweden uh, similar tools are being developed, but that they have run into problems with, with taxation and with the taxi business. Um, yeah. So well, have we, you same thing in Denmark? Well, we are working in Sweden. Uh, so so yeah. we know we know the legislation in Sweden and in Denmark very well. And um, uh, our partner in, in Sweden is uh, Blekinge uh, Trafiken in southeastern Sweden. And we also work quite closely with Skåne Trafiken, which is yeah very close uh, to Denmark and an obvious partner. And there certainly are some some issues within uh, within uh, the legislation, but that we haven't met anything that's made it uh, that that has made a barrier for our concepts. Mm. And it's a lot to do with the fact that the transaction of money is steered by us. So when we only transfer one Swedish crown per kilometer, mm. it's a shared cost of traveling with cars. Mm. So no one in our economies will start a car um, mm. and make a taxi ride for mm. one Swedish crown per kilometer. Yeah. Um, so that's the main tool. Mm. Yeah, uh, people also are curious about like safety and and also how this COVID-19 uh, situation has affected this uh, car pulling uh, situation. But unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time. So I hope that within four minutes, uh, people from the audience uh, will join you in a separate meeting room and ask more about your concept and how it how it works and how these things have been taken into consideration. We will have all our speakers um, in individual meeting rooms where you can meet them uh, online face to face and, and ask more questions. Um, and please uh, check the links that are in the chat discussion now, because when we end this webinar, in a couple of minutes, also these links will disappear. So please choose the one that you would like to uh, ask more questions and, and say the address and um, these meeting rooms will be open shortly as soon as we finish this webinar. Uh, but we actually still have one more Menti question that I would really like our audience um, to answer. Um, uh, perhaps based on these uh, presentations that we've seen today, uh, we would like to know which sectors uh, would most benefit from digital solutions in your municipality. Is it, e is it uh, healthcare uh, solutions, uh, mobility, uh, education, e-government, or perhaps entertainment? We would just like to get an overview of, of what you're working with. Okay, it's a pretty pretty diverse, I would say. Um, nobody seems to be um, that much working with entertainment quite as we expected. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, I think it's, uh, it's time uh, for Linda to perhaps uh, say a couple of words um, to wrap up uh, today's session. Uh, we have had some very interesting um, presentations. What do you say, Linda? Yeah, I think it's been really interesting. And, and I think, I mean, I would just um, echo Pips and encourage you to join us in these small chat rooms. Because I think the thing that we really miss in these, um, of course, it was really interesting to hear from, from Teresa and Andreas and, and, and about the Nabucco app as well. But um, I think uh, I miss a little bit. I want to hear a bit more about how this relates to, to what you're all doing um, out there. But um, I think... Um, I think for me, it's a big reflection is, is sort of around these these smaller details are, I think, are the, are the things that we, we always sort of come in on when we come. I think we started quite broad with myself and with Teresa, but, but when we actually uh, get into the details of what we're doing, we're actually really quite um, advanced, you can say, I think here in the noise, and we're doing some really interesting things. Um, and, and particularly, I think, the, the thing that I was really happy to hear about from both Andreas and with the Nabucco app that they are coming, you know, um, as uh, the, both these, these um, both all of this work is, is designed in rural areas for people in rural areas. So I think when we think about specifically, I mean, I know we focus quite a lot on the, the rural, urban rural um, inequities today. And, and, and of course, there's others we could 
we'll talk more about too. But I think for me, this is really a, a key to looking forward to 2030 is actually um, not just digital solutions that we, we put, we take from wherever and put in different communities, but actually the planning within the community itself uh, and these digital tools just being just that tools. So I think, I think, yeah, thank you very much. To yeah, all I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Linda, for co-hosting with me today. And thanks to all our speakers today. And thanks for the audience for being there and staying curious what happens in the Nordic countries. Um, I think it's time to wrap up this webinar, but I would just like to remind you that this is only the second session of, uh, of the webinar series. And we will have two more coming up in January and two more in February. And we have also already produced some publications that might be of, of interest. And we would also like you to participate in the January and February sessions. So uh, the next session will be on the 13th of January, and it's about uh, planning for equal rights, uh, integrating gender and youth perspectives in the um, SDG work. So we hope to see you then as well. And the recording of today uh, will be sent to you uh, tomorrow in a news mail. So in case you still want to look back and, and check some things that are there. But now I hope that you'll uh, pick up one of those links in the chat discussion and go to a meeting room if you still want to talk to one of our speakers. Because we're about to end this webinar now and then the links are kind of disappearing. So um, we will close this soon. So thank you, everyone. And uh, see you in January.